I V M. Hi and welcome to Noyo Kanoon. This is Amit from AM Nana Ventures and welcome to our today's episode on IVM and Noyo Kanoon. This one's going to be pretty interesting. I have someone so accomplished and I would say such a great personality and also a foggy brat if I can use that term and take the leeway. I have Mr. Sherbir Panag who's the partner with Panag and Babu and there are a, I would say a flight and number of achievements he's had and I like now himself to introduce himself because uh, I would be short of words to introduce him and, and such a huge personality. Shedby, welcome to the show. Uh, it's such an honor to have you. Thank you so much for taking out this time. And now I would like you to introduce yourself and, uh, you know, maybe uh, make the audience uh, have your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with with all of you this uh, this evening. And thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, don't think I deserve all of it, but nonetheless, I'll try giving it a shot. Um, as Amber mentioned, um, you know, as you mentioned, Amber, my practice is effen- essentially um, is through my law firm now where I'm a founding partner called Panag and Babu. We are a fairly large motley crew of, of lawyers uh, focused on white collar crime, which is the yeah. core of my practice where I investigate companies, um, help, um, help build up governance mechanisms and, of course, go to court and go to trial when, when things get ugly. The firm also has a has has a you know litig- commercial litigation uh, practice and a fintech right. practice. So those are the three three aspects that bring us together, and um, that's the core of core of what I do. And the accomplishments, honestly, Amber, are are sort of more to the team as a whole. I think uh, not. I, I'm not trying to you know give one of those cliches, but honestly, I I have the pleasure and privilege of working with some of the brightest minds in law in India. And and a formidable formidable team from different walks of life who sort of make the firm what what it is. Right, and and uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And for all those law students who tune in to us, you know what Sherby, I mean, what Sherby rightly said. You know, uh, of course, he himself being such a great lawyer and so accomplished. The team also does make a difference. So those of you who feel that, you know, it's the individual that counts, share be individually, yes, but also as a team, I mean, I mean, you can always have those founding principles on which he's working and the firm is working. So share be welcome. And let's start with, uh, you know, uh, quizzing you today, rather, I would say, and keep this an informal uh, session. So why I have share be today with me is he's the ace artist of uh, white collar crimes in India, if I can use that term. And share be is a foggy brat, right? So, Sherby, let's start with your personal life first. How did law come out to be? And you are generations of generations of armed forces. <laughs> I mean, our fathers have known each other. Sherby's been, I mean, generations and generations in the army. How come you are here today? <laughs> lawyer to lawyer. <laughs> that's, that's uh, you know, we've we've got we've got a significant amount of military uh, history in the family, and and, right. and probably. You know, varying counts if we sort of add in my now my cousins. So, but we're clearly right. over a hundred year, years of military service. Yes, um, I think I'm, I'm. I remain very passionate about the armed forces. I think they've right. uh, they've shaped me in 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 ways that I couldn't have had access to if not for the army. I'm very proud of our armed forces. I'm a proud right. foggy brat, military brat, whatever you call it. Right. But I think all along, Amber, it was sort of fate accompli for me. I was very, very clear that I was going to become a lawyer. And right. there were moments of, of if, I, if I had to have a backup profession, the armed right. forces would definitely be of it. Course. But I was, I was very clear that I was going to, um, you know, become a lawyer. I was going to sort of uh, pursue, uh, pursue um, the law. And the moment I sort of reached my sweet spot, which right. was that I, I wanted to have something. I had a very deep impact of my father uh, on right. my career career choices right. you know he stood he always stood out for his integrity his ethics his you know i don't like um, you know i in terms of you know he he wasn't he, he sort of set the ball rolling in terms of you know you know whether we, we were sort of the most unforgy like family you know we, we right. would in terms of whether we were using we would not be using we were not the kind of uh forgy family sitting in a staff car or you know uh or being dropped to school by by somebody from I'll, my father i'll but in and stop you there <laughs> i'll butt you and stop in there and, and narrate an incident <laughs> so uh just for everybody out there i had attended one event and we are going off track a little bit but since sherbir mentioned this uh so sir general panag was there and uh 
me and my friend who's now of course in the army we were both at that time pretty young and he looked us looked up to, uh, you know up to us and there was this young officers function happening and he walks up to me and says hey buddy where is this trouser going so i told him i said sir it's a little bit of piling up due to not working out and believe you me the best amount of soldiering i could get in those 10 odd minutes of what we wanted to be it was amazing he's a very fine gentleman i would say a true infantry soldier a true soldier in all ways and and sherbir i can see that in you and that's why i thought i'll bring it out most most of that what we learned that day in fact in those 10 15 minutes was about how principled he was how sorted he was and the way he guided us on what we should do so i can understand uh, you know and and for all you listeners you I mean i i want to bring this out you know the army really plays a big part in our lives and how we form ourselves and makes us ready to take any challenges on and and back to you sherbir i wanted to narrate this definitely no well, that's that's very 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 kind of you and and that is the kind of person my father was in terms of his commitment to the military profession yep. so i was all you know that yep. that sort of is a lesson you imbibe about being committed to your to your profession and more so uh, you know while his was sort of ethics by demonstration i felt that yes. learning from from what he sort of you know taught us at home taught us on the dinner table taught us through practice that could i make a practice out of it and i think that's that's essentially the the sort of thought process with which uh, a career in law really uh, came into being absolutely shabir and now uh let's come to your uh, i would say the legal side of life you know you graduated moved on and uh, how did this come out be that you know you wanted to enter this specially the white collar crime regime in india because it's very skewy right we didn't have any such specialized people i mean uh, i have been a part of one of the uh, uh, hearings and case law i mean cases i would say which are pertaining to a white collar crimes one was a multi level marketing scam that happened in haryana and i'll name the client now it's future maker it's still going on it was a 4000 crore scam but you have been handling them passionately and excelling how did you get the knack of handling that because compliance is one of the things that inadvertently also people tend to miss on right i mean if if we do a health check from a financial angle whether it's your audits whether it's your other legal mergers that happen and then you have these small small uh, you know nuances where you miss on to things and then there are huge repercussions to this area how did you master the art of knowing that you know hey this is what it is because lot lot of lawyers are able to cope up with this that's a great question number and let me sort of start with um a part of the journey was that i think once i had sort of decided that i wanted to be part of the of the broader corporate governance narrative right which included uh, you know and and within the white collar crime space i think there was one part of me which sort of comes from the military lineage which is that right. we were we were always looked down as an economy in terms of high intensity and high propensity of fraud corruption money laundering even when investors were looking at us the big caveats were these three aspects right and um as i was sort of you know uh, getting getting started with the law I, i had a stint with a german law firm called roxin llp which right. um which was sort of founded by uh, one of germany's uh, by one of germany's finest lawyers dr imi roxin and her right. husband klaus roxin was uh, was considered a giant in white collar crime law in the civil law countries all right and this was a you know a, a firm that was sort of at the cusp of handling some of the very most complex matters that germany was seeing at that point of time it was a true right. white collar crime boutique and as i was looking into it and the reliance that corporations had on a firm like roxine i felt that we had this entire skill set of corporate crime lacking we right. as far as india was concerned you either had you had our corporate lawyers our transactional right. lawyers who who were sort of had international acclaim in terms of their practice in terms of of their market standing then you had the criminal lawyers who were unfortunately right. because of the sort of nature of work was more focused towards traditional approaches to defense traditional approaches to blood crimes and they were sort of coming into white collar crime right and and defending a corporation has significantly different contours to it agreed investigating a corporation and looking out for nuance as you mentioned on you know whether it's yes. uh, a related party transaction yes. or how yes. siphoning of funds has taken place yes. or 
you know, misuse of assets of the corporation. All of these yes. have a have a unique skill set. And I right. think my my view was we need to have the skill set in India. It's an important skill set because a large multinational company has access to such counsel in all other financial hubs. They have access to such counsel in London, New York, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. The, the foreign law firms have been able to set up shops, Singapore, Dubai. And suddenly Absolutely. when you come to India, this entire skill set was missing. So part of it was to come back and set up the skill set. And I started, I came back, worked with, uh, worked in Mumbai, was fortunate enough to meet others who shared this common vision. I was working with Zulfikar Memon at MZM Legal. We, um, I owe, you know, a great debt to, to Zulfi as we, we fondly call him yep. in terms yep. of seeing the vision, seeing the market vacuum, and then being willing to sort of reorient and, and come into, uh, you know, try and move this towards a more global standards practice. Right. And I think that's, that's sort of the, the, the message and the, the standard through which the Panagan Babu was also founded is that right. how do we are, we are going to address this market vacuum and we're going to address it in a manner that's consistent with how the kind of advice a client would get in Washington, D.C., would get in London, would get in Europe and is now going to get in India. Absolutely, Shabir. And, you know, that's been the excelling point that we see now that how you've established it and, and taken it forward because India is has always been absent with such concepts. You know, we've had very traditional kind of litigation and uh, it has always been either civil, criminal, but when we space out into corporate side of things, it's cute. And to challenge that and get into that space has been great. Now, my next question is going to be, you know, that area. I mean, people don't understand the challenges. Like, I mean, just to give you an example, and if I move forward, the basic challenge has been that when, uh, you know, you file something like this or a situation like this comes up, uh, the police does not know what to do. The court does not have precedents as to how to handle the matter. And there are clients, so many clients who are languishing or maybe have issues where they're not able to decide as to what is to be done when a notice is served upon, let's say, from SEBI or maybe let's upon, say, from a local administration, the SIT is being set up, you know, your auditors going for a toss. Enron, I mean, such a major scam that happened around the world and and there were such deficiencies. And then India happened and then Harshad Mehta happened and so forth, so on. It continues and now it's in the domain. Isn't it challenging from a law perspective that, you know, in the absence of very detailed precedents on such, I mean, just to give, I mean, just for the audience to know, you know what, even from an auditing perspective, uh, if you if you take the line of auditing, financial auditing or siphoning off of funds, there aren't many precedents of the same situations. There's always been a different judgment altogether. And we've had very skewed kind of judgments on all these issues. I mean, how do you tackle that? I think Amber, that's a that's an important point and sort of gets raised into a bunch of, you know, into a, a series of domains. Yes. Um, definitely on one part is that our law enforcement authorities um, did need a certain degree of capacity building up. By yes. capacity, I just don't mean in terms of adding people. I mean in terms of access to technology, yes. in terms of access to training, intellectual capital that, the, right. you know, that right. and institutional knowledge. Right. You know, a lot of law enforcement is institutional knowledge to know the patterns through which they get done, systems and software that allow you to, to take in vast amounts of data, synthesize that data, because in complex, you know, transactions, it's it's sort of, it looks nice in a movie to see, you know, a, a room yeah. full of documents all the way to the top and one yes. person going through it, but it's not. And that's why even at the beginning when I started, it's a team effort. So we definitely had, you know, capacity issues. We continue to have capacity issues in right. terms of numbers. Our, right. our ratio of, of financial crime law enforcement authorities to the instances of crimes right. is, is relatively low. The courts need the precedent and the number of cases being brought in is evolving. Now, you know, it's 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 chicken and egg. You have a smaller bunch of law enforcement you know, officials. Yep. Um, it results in lesser cases that come to court or cases that come to court after a significant amount of amount of time. Right. And therefore, the courts are by the time the courts apply themselves and run through a complete cycle. Right. And, you know, I'm not going to get too much into judicial yes. delay here, yes. but I think globally, a trial from start to finish, including appeals, you know, virtually has is, is a long process. A long and process. and you end up coming up with 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 defining precedent on a on a decade by decade basis it's right. not really something that comes out in a you know two year basis yes, yes on procedural items yes. on a yes. on bail or what kind of cases can be brought in or yes. investigative overreach yes. 
that kind of precedent gets set but core precedent on principles you know yes. what would constitute yes. what becomes the standard of criminal intent right. what becomes the standard of malicious intent where has where has the breach of an auditor's duty fiduciary breach of a director right. occurred we we are we are still sort of we we still have a long way to to go but i think that's really where the challenge is amber for for all of us in this field right. and it's a growing tribe of 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 lawyers and professionals is is the is it's 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 an open canvas to mold the law to help push the law on on first principles and in all of the rest of the items you know when we discuss um ultimately white collar crimes or financial crimes the bedrock that they are based on is is criminal, criminal law. law absolutely so, so irrespective of of there is a significant amount of nuance that goes in but the first principles founding principles baseline emanates from criminal law so we are not entirely precedent less correct we do have precedent we have to now interpret that precedent we have to conjoin that precedent to modern circumstances no absolutely and you know uh, for all those listeners and law students what shedvi has narrated is just a gist of all that and you can imagine how challenging it is and should be rightly put by you in fact i'll narrate one small incident as well and this is pertinently related to indirect taxation we spoke about related party i'm going to talk from that angle a small mistake for importation between two related parties can lead to an overload of duties where evasion can also be a part of it and also i mean honest mistake of fact but i challenge the situation where you know uh, it was an honest mistake of fact right but it it happened to be one where uh, an adverse order was given by the authorities due to lack of understanding that you know in the domain in where they operate it is not something which works and the litigation piled on on and on and on, and on until high court just uh, penalized the client you know with uh, with some uh, uh, repercussions which we had to face so it's it's quite a challenging and a and a, a daunting domain to be in and to be able to rope everybody in uh, to cope with this uh, Uh, is something i think which shebir is doing brilliantly now we'll come to the next part of things shebir now uh, interestingly so many cases have happened right and and lot of people ask me on the show that sir what does criminal law have to do with the uh, financial crimes and you highlighted that point very wisely that you know it's actually the criminal intent and then the finance part adds up to the whole uh, aspect of whatever way it takes so just for those law students and prospective lawyers who are there what would you like to you know highlight with your i mean i would want your viewpoints on this and how are they so interconnected so i think you know there is there are no financial crimes without criminal law in terms of the legal application of it yes there's a growing body of law in the west which is uh, civil and administrative penalties disgorgement of profits fines uh, business right. exclusion but at the core of it uh, you know the the theories of criminal prosecution and punishment whether it's deterrence etc have remained intact as far as financial crimes is concerned right so um yes you know for for all practical purposes you fall back on very common sections um as far as in the indian penal code is concerned whether it's section 420 yes. cheating 406 yes. for breach of trust forgery so your core becomes sections okay. that have been applied for potentially non financial yes. crime instances but are now applied to financial crimes and then you fall back on something like common intention right. or conspiracy which again has a significant body of work in in india um i think the more structural concepts which are emerging are those of corporate criminal yes. liability vicarious liability how does a corporation get held liable when there are criminal uh, act is it traditional master servant relationship is it more nuanced and here again you know you fall back to your first principles of criminal law you can't apply even when a charge sheet is right. is prepared or framing of charges is are done charges have to be framed against an individual accused you cannot frame you know uh, the judge has to apply his mind to each and every accused so likewise we are sort of you know struggling with these cases when you have something like a you know you have some of the larger cases where there were 230 250 plus uh, plus yes. accused persons who were sort of in the corporation at different yes. points of time a lot of these principles are coming to the forefront we do have some good precedent but of course long way to go but uh, for anybody out there who sort of wants to make a career right. in financial crimes um being a strong criminal lawyer 
on first principles is is your bedrock there is no there is no glamour to financial right. crimes outside you know your age old crpc and yeah. ipc and everything else in the special right. statute but it falls back and it interplays no, with and this the is why i wanted you to answer this because you know people feel financial crimes it's i'm going to be glorified i don't have to get into the criminal side of things criminal is hectic report share be said correctly is it's the crux of how you bring out your practice and how he has done or anybody else would do now should be i'll come to the to the corporate aspect of things you know we we spoke about from a criminal aspect now from a corporate uh, aspect let's let's look at it from an individual corporate liability aspect you know mostly people say directors partners are the financial uh, you know uh, leaders who tend to commit this tend to commit these crimes Uh, and the lower staff. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm being very direct. You know, the the lower staff or or the, the different strata of staff that we have, which is into managerial or support staff, administrative staff, does not, you know, engage into any of these practices. And sometimes it happens that when the audit happens, you know, it's it's actually the liability of the partner to take the brunt of maybe some misdeeds that you find in the uh, in the whole lot, right? Uh, as far as our company law is concerned i mean we're still evol- evolving and i'm 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 too absent about it i mean i would want you to throw some light don't you feel the accountability is still uh, letting off uh, these kind of misdemeanors or i would say such kind of convictions that take place that people still go scot free i mean keeping bhopal gas tragedy in mind with everything that happened on a different on a corporate angle i would say so let's let's sort of look at a let's first try and look at the position of yes. law and then yes. distinguish it from the from the yes. from prosecu- from bad prosecution bad prosecution and and right. poor prosecution objectives so in terms of position of law there is you know ultimately i think the principle that we spoke of criminal liability has to be attributable Correct. to an individual and and within the corporate structure as well so there yes there is corporate criminal yes. liability let's keep that aside but the individual actions that an individual that a particular yes. employee at yes. whatever level i i think um, senior management bears yes. the brunt on two counts yes either they directed it or they were willfully blind questions. and didn't ask the right Correct. questions to prevent it. so and the the law rightfully so attributes a you know it's if if one had to make, make a contractual claim you would sort of do it between um, a w- willful negligence. conduct or negligence and not looking into it willfully being blind yes. that's that's negligence yes. but criminal yes. law doesn't make that distinction you know it it sort of recognizes them yes. both as egregious conduct so as far as who goes you know as far as the law is concerned i think the law adequately captures to attribute criminal liability to to he or she who has committed the offense in addition to corporate criminal liability if it's made out in terms of as a matter of practice i think for several reasons you know in certain yes. cases we have very good prosecution in yes. certain cases we have weak prosecution but building ultimately who goes scot free or not is also a function of how the case is built how the investigation is done a majority of cases in india you know we celebrate them at the stage of arrest and attachment exactly. of assets or raids and that 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 is yes. treated as a public victory but unfortunately it's not a conviction yes. has to be treated as a public victory and and when somebody goes scot free when they need to it's a, there are the factor is essentially of evidence and how the case is presented and whether or not the defense was able to break the state's the state's uh, state's burden and here is where capacity of law enforcement authorities becomes very very important their own ability to be able to prosecute such cases their own ability to be able to take procedures that were made in the 1970s yes. manuals yes. that were written in the 70s 80s and being able to adapt them to offenses that are taking place today so you know adapting a 70s code and an 80s 90s manual to an offense that has to a traditional blood crime or a traditional Absolutely. issue you know as as terrorism versus adapting it to adapting it to something in terms of how uh, complex transactions were 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 sort of done how cryptocurrency got involved how payments were made how tax structures were used there is there are there is a multitude of skill sets that come into it and and our authorities i must say have become significantly better at prosecuting they have good conviction records 
but is it ideal it's not, not but it's not ideal anywhere in the world it's okay. not ideal anywhere right and you know should we rightly answer that in fact uh, and and i have already named my client which i handled in one of those small situations unlike sherbi who handles many but in that aspect also sherbi you know what happened what uh, with us was and i'll discuss the case a little uh, i'm not going to go into too many details but just a little bit of it that ed and the sit came pretty hard on the on the xyz gentleman and uh, there was violation of some fundamental rights etc etc but that again depends on region to region how it's being processed and as you said assessment of authorities with regards to you know where to go after and who to go after in the way uh, trying to adapt with you know the current trends that are there so again another law student put this up to me so i would answer you know what it depends totally on on so many circumstances which here we highlighted right and uh, here we now coming to the next aspect this is going to be tough for you because we're going to put it a little a politicized in a a politicized way but <laughs> what do you think have been one of your major career highlight cases i would say you i mean where you feel that you know hey this is what i really really wanted to do and this is what i really found and you know was one where you would say any law student or any prospective lawyer would want to be at that stage you don't need to name the client though <laughs> we'll keep it like that so amber i think um, you know we've um, we've been lucky to have quite a few such moments right. in the in the recent past and of course uh, naming a client is tough but right yeah yeah absolutely we've we we've had moments when we were sort of in the thick of action right. from every single headline in the country was talking about what yeah. what our client was doing yeah. the news cycle continued for months and years at end and ultimately we were able to you know within all the noise within all the emotion against the client were in a position to sort of um uh obtain an effective resolution for the for the client from a multitude of authorities so i think that really stands out as one the second was there was a very this was a very very complex matter everybody again a lot of spotlight on the case in terms of what was going to happen you know special court supreme court monitoring it and again we you know sort of were able to you know really come in and the the matter had proceeded for a good amount of time we were really able to come in alter the strategy make the strategy more effective and resulted in uh, a fair number of our of of individuals getting discharged and you know sort of really ring fencing the the focus through a through a strategic uh, through strategically assessing and addressing the legal points the factual points that right. the authorities got long that got got wrong and you know i think that was a great intellectual high in terms of a result yep but i think something that, I, that that i hold very dear to me is a is an event last year right. when a client of ours was unfairly in one of those you know typical moments of police overreach was was sort of you know was named in an fir and this is a global fortune 500 company wow. with operations in several parts of the world wow. and the entire board of directors were named and um, as luck would have it it was uttar pradesh and uttar pradesh at this point of time did not have anticipatory bail uh, yes. so we, we sort of crafted a strategy went and you know one of my partners successfully argued and got the matter out got one of them out through a through a quashing and a stay and we then felt that we'll get the others out at a parity order and just the moment when we were going to get it out on parity the anticipatory bail um uh, anticipatory bail notification came back in yep. and there was an absolute flurry of what was going to happen the high court said all and all matters that were here for stay on arrest go back to the oh, lower oh, courts the lower court didn't know what to yeah. do and they were sort of you know struggling and and i recall you know traveling to um to um to hapur in yeah. in uttar pradesh yeah. which has been infamous for other yes. reasons <laughs> the situation was 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 gadamukteshwar yes. and arguing before the judge and as we walked in we had a couple of local council who were sort of assisting with filing right. and they you know walked with my team right. and I walked in they all sort of said you know sir don't argue like delhi and just do it you know be very precise and i said nothing doing you know we we argued at length for two and a half right. hours and finally left with you know and then the judge sort of gave us uh, gave us the order and that was one of the first anticipatory bail orders that ever came out in uttar pradesh wonderful. if not the wonderful. first wonderful and you know that that feeling of getting the same is something i would say which is unbelievable for any lawyer and and most satisfying 
that you know you do that and congratulations to you doing it in Hapur and areas and going up there it, well, it was fun it, it was, it was fun. No, I, I'm sure but you know uh, people have a very different perception I mean, I mean and, and Sherbir is a living example guys I mean if you have it in you you can do it anywhere it is it's not that it's too difficult anywhere I would say I think you know, I, I, I yeah. want to make a point yeah. on that I want to yeah. make a point on that I think there is this unnecessary yes. unnecessary regionalism yes. that we yes. have built yes. out yes totally correct as in of who can yes. appear where. I think throughout the lockdown, this has been a blessing yes. for us. In any case, it's been part of our firm's philosophy of we are in India jurisdiction agnostic. In our area of expertise, we will go to Ahmedabad, we will go to Guj- we will go to a, a small part, we will go to a court in Bhuj, we will go to Mumbai, we will be in all the high courts. And I think part of the, uh, in fact, you know, we are a Delhi-based yeah. firm yeah. with an office yeah. in Bangalore. But if you take the lockdown and look at our filings, we probably were in Chennai for we, my colleagues from our, in, in our litigation team have, have sort of the majority of our filings have Absolutely. been in Chennai or have been in, you know, have been in Allahabad or have been in other small, you know, uh, cities or towns or, or, or the larger, larger high courts. And the, you know, we, we are blessed in India to have a, have a license that allows us to practice all over the country. And honestly, we need to use it much more. This whole aspect of, you know, we we have we have you you prepare for local procedural differences, but those procedural differences don't change the law. You don't go and argue Correct. procedure. You go and Correct. argue the law. You go and argue a point of law Correct. for your client, and uh, the law what doesn't change? change. You know, we are uh, so on that point. I think uh, I personally have a lot of disdain for this yeah, whole regional so practice. And people say uh, it's very. And it and is, it is like I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, the, the best was since I also go to Haryana Punjab High Court, right? Somebody questioned me in Delhi saying, hey, man, I mean, you're going to those areas where they don't understand uh, the other principles of how we argue. I mean, I said, I mean, we're doing it. I'm doing it in your courts. We're doing it. There. And, and you can't question yeah. that, right? And I think every every court, every court I mean, deserves the, the respect, the respect of the majesty Absolutely. of the court's demand. And... and a fair argument is the same in any court. I, I'm also sort of, I'm not a big fan of sort of, you know, creating yes. this divide between yes. what is a yes. premier high court and yes. what's a non-premier high court. And I want, you know, ultimately your client um, and, in, you know, in our case, we, since majority of our practice is representing multinational companies, um, our our objective is getting a solution and, within and the framework of the law. Way. I think our to go, I mean, for any any prospective lawyer out there who's listening to it, I think what Sherbir is narrating right now is something you should have your ears open on because you need to have uh, this kind of a mindset to be a successful lawyer and to respect the law of the land and also be uh, very grounded to realize uh, all of these facts. You know, Sherbir, uh, really commendable on that. And, you know, I mean, that's why I said, I mean, you did it in Harpur, you you did that. It's a it's a precedent for a lot of people. In fact, for us, people are scared. Are we UP jayenge, we'll go to Allahabad. I don't know how people will behave. Noida is so tough. I don't know how it's going to be. No, and I think the, and, the bar is the bar is yeah, most welcoming yeah. at most places. In fact, some of the best, best conversations we've had um, have been on in travel. We've met some right. fantastic colleagues. We've brainstormed with them. We've had some, you know, you it it's it's. Uh, I remember doing a, right. a large shipping matter in uh, which involved, you know, shipping fraud, right. etc. I was in Ahmedabad, Ahmedabad a lot, and I made some fantastic friends and colleagues in Ahmedabad. Yes. No, so it's not just professional, yes. but it's personal. And the bar was most welcoming. In fact, there were several occasions where you know I would be listed something else, and I'd mention the matter and say right. I need to fly back. And I've been here for three days and they'd be from right. senior counsels at the at the at the uh, bar at the Gujarat High Court to to junior counsels, all of whom would say, absolutely, you know, Mr. Panag, you take your flight back and please get home safe. We've seen you've been here for three days. So I think the bar is very welcoming. Of course, we have, our, you know, yeah. with everything, no system is perfect and you always have a have an odd occasion here or here or there. But uh, I think as a whole, we must we've got to go where the brief takes us. It's sort of it's it's almost a principle from the military. You know, and you've got to go where you need to go. Yes, and you can't uh, come up later on and say I won't go to UP, I won't go to Jharkhand, I won't go to Bastar, I won't go to West Bengal. You've got to go where the brief takes you. And you know what? This also I would highlight, uh, like to highlight in Shabir is just since because he's from a Fauji background, this mindset is always there. You cannot regionalize, you cannot divide, you cannot say that I cannot do that. I see most of lawyers, in fact, in Delhi, I've seen, and I'm being very upfront about it, who come and tell you. Uh, there is a challenge with this. I'll not go to this office. I'll not do that. 
you can't do that and i think commendable uh, share me what you put out i think for young lawyers this is a must must that uh, you uh, should keep this in mind when you get into practice or any kind of legal work share me closing comments from your side because i think we've taken enough of your time i don't want to use it up more and and let you be on this because we've hassled you enough but no, no, uh, no, no, any no. closing comments from your side you know uh, it was wonderful having you here i would want to have some closing comments maybe for the audience the listeners prospective lawyers uh, what would you like to say So I think Ambar, I'm going to sort of fall back on a script I always I always use at such times. I think first and foremost, there are a lot of us out there who'd like the the tribe of, and I'm going to pitch for my own practice. Would like the tribe yeah. of white collar crime lawyers to increase in the country. Yes. And, and it's a it's a deeply intellectual pursuit, the the profession of the law, and finding right. a, a hyper specialism within that adds to the to the charm. So anybody who sort of who 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 is considering the practice of white collar crime do read up on it and and definitely consider it it's a it's a fantastic journey you know it gives you the best of both worlds it's it gives you the best of being a corporate lawyer and a criminal lawyer right. so you can you can watch boston legal or suits or whatever else the yes. flavor of the day, is. The day yes. is in and all damages or how to get away with murder and still yes. not you know kill, kill your conscience on the fact of what kind of a lawyer you became <laughs> So I think that's the that's the first point I'd make. The second right. point in terms of uh, you know my prospective colleagues who are going to be joining the profession are in the right. profession and are looking are are younger colleagues. Right. Um you know ladies and gentlemen I think this you know it, it all boils down to how much you read. And right. there's there is you know one can uh, there, there there are lots of you know usual clichés of no escape of you know I think the hard work needs to be in a particular direction the hard work has to be rewarding and the hard work in our profession is reading. in a country where we have a common law system which is based on precedent and we are gifted our generation is gifted with the internet we yes. have no reason to sort of you know use traditional things of oh it will take 10 years to make a practice and work under somebody for this much time or that if if you are not using the internet to your fullest advantage you're not reading as much career progression thereafter is not a matter of being a first generation second generation lawyer or or you know which law school you went to it's effectively something that you need to take ownership of i have right. a lot of lot of you know young law students who write to me on linkedin and say uh, sherbir you know i'm a first generation lawyer and i said buddy so am i you know uh, yeah. i was I was a first generation lawyer in Germany I'm a first generation lawyer in Bombay I'm a first generation lawyer here in fact yeah. I never considered considered it we've all yeah. gone through the grind we all went through the 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 low pay you know the take the bus and take Everything. the train and Everything. and sweat yes. it out we all went yes. through that grind but we went through that grind by saying we're going to work hard we're going to work hard in a particular direction and we're not right. going to make excuse, excuses for our circumstances I didn't go to a fancy large law firm and uh, never had that opportunity never probably started my career at 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 the pinnacle of what what some of my colleagues got paid but right. you know you you follow a path you get down to it you work hard and uh, and and focus on building and developing yourself if if as a young professional if you look every quarter or every 3 months that you look back at yourself if you don't see new skills you don't see a change in the manner in which you're drafting in you've not learned a new skill you've not refined a new skill then there's something you're in my opinion there's something you're doing wrong so that's sort of my take away Yep, and thank you so much, Shirbi. That's absolutely true. In fact, uh, this whole goes that you know this first generation lawyer thing is out now. Uh, it has to be that how good are you in your field and uh, how you can progress. Uh, and uh, Shirbi, thank you so much. And all of those prospective people who want to see Shirbi again, please do write into us. I'm going to put your queries forward to him. Maybe he can give you some free advice on these things. And uh, and I would say, Shirbi, thank you so much. Such a wonderful and uh, you know a brilliant time we had uh, in. Grateful. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very, very busy man. We've been able to place him Thank up you, months man. now, and uh, for uh, for him being here, I mean, it's an honor for us. So, Shabir, thank you, thank you so much for being. Uh, thank you, Amber. Great, great talking to all of you, and thanks to your colleagues Rishi and Antriksh as well. So, thank you yeah. all for having me here today. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Know Your Kanun. Catch Know Your Kanun on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcasts from. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Storytel and the Whole Truth Foods. Thank you for supporting us. 
So a great bunch of episodes this week. First, let me tell you about The Note with Maru Kinayat. It was featuring Asaduddin Owesi. She spoke to the AIMIM leader to understand what the Indian Muslim voter wants and how his party is any different from the BJP. On Advertising is Dead, Varun spoke with Malika Sadani. Malika is the founder and CEO of The Moms Company. They discussed the science of motherhood. On Naan Kari with Sadaf and Archit, Dhananjay Chuck of the Edges and Sledges podcast showed up. So we did another crossover, this time with food and cricket. On Agla Station Adulthood, Ritasha and Ayushi talked to Gaurang Sangwi, head of digital business at DSP Mutual Fund. The episode has some logical and realistic advice, especially for millennials, on to how to invest their money. Shunya One is back this week with Sheila Ditya and myself. We spoke to Anirudh Singla of Pepper Content this week. Really interesting conversation. Anirudh gave us some real deep insights into content creation and how they're thinking about different ways of creating it. Do check them out. Really fun show. Really fun conversation. And with that, we hope to see you again next week. What are some of the radical changes that are now shaping our workspace? With physical distancing and heightened safety protocols being the norm, will technology finally make its large-scale entry to the workspace? Will design as we know it change for the long term? Is it possible for the Indian commercial real estate space to adopt a 360-degree approach to sustainability? Join our hosts at the Future of Space podcast by RMZ as we deliberate with industry leaders, analysts and bright young minds on the way forward for the workspace given the new covid normal tune in to the ivm podcasts app or wherever you stream your favorite podcasts 